This will be a test here to showcase uh, current state of things with LTI and what I'm working on. Uh, so this will be a very quick video. So we've got a course here. We've got a encoded LTI launch link. Let's see what that looks like. So the idea is that we point to one location for everything, um, everything we ever want to do uh, with this course. Now, I've already set it up in terms of doing the launch ahead of time. So let's see what that would have created. In the management system here, we have just kind of this course placeholder, right? So there's nothing called this course, obviously. This is for testing purposes. Um, but the signature it leaves behind is what's important. So it basically is storing a record of the unique identifier in the originating LMS uh, that came across so that it can match on. Um, every section in every LMS should have one of these. Uh, the resource launch link that you're coming from should be able to point you back here. But so the first launch comes through and basically populates this system of all this data. And then it goes and builds the Drupal site. Now, because I've already built the Drupal site, I can't necessarily show that. Now, the idea is that I click this link, it hits this source, looks at this and sees it exists, and then will uh, more or less get handed off to the appropriate final destination. In this case, the course site with just the content. Now, to look at the sections in here, because this is important, uh, we have one bank of content. This is one course home, if you will, that we're going to generically point everything to. Um, and you'll see right now I have one section, and sections are for organizational purposes. It's basically mirroring uh, part of what's in that central information system and part of what's in the LMS. Uh, so you can see right now, if I pop up my little toolkit here, I've only got one section. Now, if we go over to LTI, we're going to do a launch link. Let's launch. And what this is going to do is, you don't even notice, right? Very seamless access. What that did is it hit our center point, the online.ana site, said, hey, I've got an LTI launch. The online site said, oh, I'm already well aware of the fact that you, you've LTI launched from here before and that you wanted to set up a tool. Here's the final location I want to send you to. And then, thanks to the wonders of the uh, LTI tool provider module in Drupal, it automatically creates the section record that matches. So if we look at this, I've got my master section, I'll reload. Uh, the difference between these two, sorry, I keep going back and forth. Um, this one, I'm user one on my root you know, user account. This is a, a fake instructor account. Um, because of the way LTI and Drupal works, you can't do a user one launch because um, I'll be logging in user one that has lots of permissions. So we'll see here now as user one, I can see, hey, there's this other section that showed up. And that section in the context of here, it's another section record. You can click on that. And I can see that this is active because it was a recent launch. Um, I had It has a title, which it you know, goes and looks up what the title is to, to engineer here. Um, and the section ID, which is the unique identifier. So we've kind of got these three keys. The, the start of all these keys is from your LMS, which the click-through goes to the online site. The online site keeps a trace of it and then sends it on to your final destination. Right? So we've got this kind of three-part LMS experience um, through the Elms Learning Network. So what we're going to do now is we'll look at the group here. If we hit people, you can see that this actually pulled in the roster too. So we're using something similar to the LTI 1.1 spec um, to go and pass the, the roster back. Um, it's an angel specific function right now, uh, but it, sh it should be pretty easy to use the real one once we have support for it internally. So this is, this is what happens. Uh, the idea is you're basically augmenting your learning management system um, and bran branching it out into this you know, Drupal-based network. Um, these tabs and things are all being powered by the course information system. Uh, so in this case, you know, hey, what other systems is this using? Right now, nothing, quite frankly. Uh, so let's change that. Again, another advantage to this whole structure is very consistent naming. And so I can quickly jump to there. We'll have links to get there and improve the usability in the near future. But we'll go into offerings. I'm going to edit this section record. We're going to have a, a little bit of a conversation here. So our welcome page 
is hey cool stuff. All right. I'm very creative, as you can see. <laughs> uh, we can have files here that we upload, so let's grab a sample syllabus. I've got one here called literally sample syllabus. Um, we'll just grab a sample syllabus and, for the welcome letter, too. Uh, so we're going to upload these. Again, this is in our central repository, if you will. Brian is the instructor. Um, and then we can set up the resources in use by this. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail as to what this means, but you'll see the effect shortly. Uh, just in case you're curious, you'll see we have the access credentials. We can actually load in, bind multiple ones to the same point, and we also have durations. Uh, so once the course site recognizes that the CIS has told it to shut off access, it basically will uh, once it gets outside these rangers. Services in use, so we can also say, hey, this uses the studio tool, which I rarely show. Um, but is a, a prototype. Okay, and so right there we had a conversation take place. So the CIS in the middle of this whole equation noticed, oh, there have been section records changed associated with something I'm aware of. In this case, if we go to services, these two services. So there's a online.ana and there's courses.ana and there's studio.ana. And this system kind of lives distributed across all of them. And what we do is we pretty much have these structured conversations via cron jobs. And so what it did is whenever something needs to change, it passes a special credential to the other sites in the network, if you will, uh, via cron job. And as you'll notice already, we've updated what is available on the welcome page. Now, if I click syllabus, we get the some different language here. I can click download syllabus. Something else and an advantage of this is that we can create very structured paths. So let me get out of this angel window, open the same thing. Uh, so you can see this is actually just slash syllabus. Um, because we have multiple sections being managed in here, but being fed data from over here, we could actually have multiple offerings over time. Uh, this is the data management system in this case. So if you manage the syllabi uh, as a piece of data that you want to manage across time, you can always reliably hit this link. And because LTI has passed someone through to the correct location, this will automatically give them the correct syllabus. Why this is important is that it's pretty much routinizing and automating the logistics of course setup semester to semester you will be able to essentially program a course on one side as to how it should react on the other. Uh, if you want to you know, embed a link to download the syllabus, there it is. And it's the one that I'm currently in this section to obtain. To showcase that, if we switch sections, right? So right now I'm in this BTO 108. Let's jump over to master section and see what happens. You so see, you must be enrolled in this course in order to view the syllabus. That's just kind of default fodder language. Um, but this contextual information here has changed. Why? Because master section isn't a real thing. Um, it's just kind of a way of getting the system primed so that you can start to develop your course res resources before the semester has actually started and you have you know, people LTI launching in. So let's drop back to an actual section, and we'll look at this resources page. So again, the resources page has been pulled because I changed some select boxes on the other system. And you'll see here we have kind of default resource language. We have something saying, hey, you're in the course services exists. Um, something saying, hey, there's a studio service that you could go over to and, and bounce to that. Here's some directions about how to use different resources at the university. Um, and so you can have different section logistics Again, giving you different ways of presenting the resources page, but always point everyone to the resources page. Allow logistics to drive what type of resources someone is given. Um, if we go to the syllabus, again, the download link there, help gets primed. There's my instructor contact info for Brian is cool, plus some fodder language that comes from our center point system. Um, because this is all managed centrally, we have the ability to modify that language. So see we have resources here. 
and we've got global versus system resources, and we'll get into what that distinction is. But um, footer language is a good example of a system resource. So this is our generic footer language that we want to have used across all of our courses. Uh, we no longer have to update footer language to ensure that copyright statements are the same or uh, that, you know, if this, lang this standard university language is changed, we can update it in one place. Um, I believe it's monthly. The systems in the CIS network check to make sure that system level resources uh, make sense and are, are what they should be. Uh, there, here's some language for LMS out of sync. So this is a message that we send people if they're able to achieve access denied. Uh, inaccurately because there are windows currently where that's possible since we haven't rolled LTI into full production. Um, so this is a message that would get sent out. That way you can tweak it in one place, have it called from multiple places. Uh, the digital campus language, for example. Uh, so if these directions were to change, say that digital campus isn't using Silverlight Player anymore, I hope someday they're not, <laughs> um, and it's HTML5, we can modify this language and because every course and in specifically every section using that technology. We don't want to give directions to students about how to use Digital Campus if that section doesn't use Digital Campus. Uh, what if it's a blended learning experience where they actually go to a classroom as opposed to taking it fully online? Maybe Digital Campus is replacing part of that experience. We don't want to confuse students by giving them that, those additional directions needlessly. Um, some other transaction things, we have the welcome letter, you can see this works in the same way, give you the correct welcome letter contextually, um, as well as the ability to just download the letter, and that's a very similarly structured link. Uh, something else that still, still needs some refinement is the guided tour. Um, I don't care about Adobe Flash, thank you. <laughs> so the guided tour is um, instead of giving people directions or a video or whatever on how to use the interface. Everyone's used the web page before, right? So they're, they're pretty familiar with how to use these web pages um, to called your course. Uh, but let's just say you want to give them a brief refresher just to, so they're aware of where things are throughout the semester. So let's get to know our course. So logistics, as you can see, these messages are provided at the top. We tell you this is everything logistical about the course. Um, and FYI, I wrote this language, obviously it would change once an instructional designer gets their hands on it. Uh, course outline, this is where you'll be navigating through the course. Title, this is what you read about, right? So I went a little overboard. <laughs> Reading, you can do that on the page. Media, so here's an example of media, and I have to get it to actually render. Um, but you know, just so you're aware, here's some media, so we can do that. The directions, so oftentimes you'll see steps to completion, just so you're aware whenever you see this visual cue, um, that these are directions. YouTube, some media is on YouTube, just, you know, that we have the sample thing here, and this is blocked because, as you saw, I, I need to update Flash Player. And then feedback, we're always looking to improve this course. So that's just a, a real basic way of introducing people to the course. Um, another interesting, you see this page scrolls forever. Those directions that were loaded onto the page are actually embedded at the bottom, so it's... Uh, an accessible experience, which I, I found interesting considering how visual it is. Um, so drop into welcome again. Let's just click through some of the pages and see. So this content was provided by default. You have the option of having, I believe, up to four different things created. Let's see. So this was, there's a build service instance, if you will. Uh, so basically the LTI launch is filling out all this information automatically, but you can see there's a lot of options to get this site built. Um, and we have a couple different outlines. So minimal instructional outline is really just a couple pages uh, to get you the idea that it's there. Lesson-based outline is what this was produced based on. And again, you can delete this stuff very quickly. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the outline designer, then you're really missing out. <laughs> so it creates this lesson outline. See, so we can manage multiple outlines. Um, that way we can have multiple forms of content here uh, as the content, you know, grows and evolves year to year kind of a thing. Uh, so if I needed to, I could, you know, drop in and I don't have the permissions to do it at the moment, but I could actually delete these pieces of material. Um, you can delete the entire outline if you have high enough, high enough permissions. Uh, instructional designers do currently instructor roles don't based on the way we have this set up. Um, but 
beauty of the outline designer is you just kind of take things and drag them around. You can see there's also this um, kind of hover effect here. Um, that's a keyboard accessibility function. So I can click and get to this and then if I remember what the key combination is, I can, there we go. Uh, so when I hold on shift, I can kind of bounce through them. Uh, see, I have a bit of a redraw error here in Safari. <laughs> um, so it's the outline designer. We can add pages. Let's see, get saved there. And then we can rename them quickly. Again, hopefully you're familiar with the outline designer. It's pretty much what prompted all my work. Um, Let's get out of there. I'm going to look at some other things we can do. So again, update the outline right there, put it in the right place. Um, we can hit edit on here. You can see because it's Drupal 7, we get the overlay that pops up. We have a very clean user experience, and I, I actually have to take this revision log information off of here, but it's not a terrible thing to be there. It's just not necessary. Um, so we have very few options for production of this content. Um, we have a new CK Editor 4 based WYSIWYG editor, um, but it still has the same old content templates we can dump in. And we will be building more. This is just, you know, kind of sample to get it out the door. So I can quickly generate a well structured, very nice looking uh, reading list in this case. So another thing here. Um, and you can provide linkage. You see that this little tab spacing here that pops up, this return carriage. Um, that's something that CK Editor put in so that you can get to places that are typically harder to, you know, put a space in between items. It's not perfect, but it, it does a better job than it used to, right? So, like, putting one at the end. Um, some other things you can do in here. Uh, source, it's using a project called Code Mirror, so you get this nice, clean, Dreamweaver-esque source with color coding, collapsible lines, uh, which is very impressive. I was very impressed when I found this this part that you could do this in the browser without influ negatively impacting either side of the coin, which is very important. Um, there are, is preliminary support for what is called the Quail API that does some uh, checking content for accessibility issues. Um, it's hit or miss at the moment. Uh, I'm just more or less putting it there to get people okay with the fact that it's coming. Um, but if it, when it starts to work, it actually starts to give you hints as to what should be resolved in your content to make it more accessible. It won't prevent you from saving the page, um, but it will make you aware that you're, you're about to commit something that has an accessibility issue to it, um, which is oftentimes people are committing these errors without knowing. Um, you don't want to do it. It's just, it's hard to know what the standards are all the time. Uh, some other bits here we have um, I'm not sure if I've added the typo oh the typo reports are there right so this is a, a lightweight uh, moderation system for content I don't want to modify oh, not more than 20 characters could you know uh, so let's say this is a typo you get a prompt you need to fix this for later and we'll send a typo report so you can get into some editorial workflows maybe I'm an instructional designer I don't want to modify that content right now um, it might have implications. It might not even be a typo. It might be, you know, oh, well, there aren't actually three readings here. Um, so maybe we say that. We didn't talk about three readings. I thought there were four. All right, so we can send that off. And then if we go to the typo reports page, You'll see there's our two typos, as well as the context in which it, this typo, if you will, occurred. Um, so again, very lightweight editorial types of uh, workflow here. Don't want to get too heavy with that. That probably should be happening somewhere else. Or you can get that functionality added in at any time. We're always willing to accept uh, feature requests for the platform. You might notice at the bottom there's this little this little link, it's actually off the page. Um, this kind of floats with you to get, because you notice we have a lot of potentially many sections in here, right? So as this list will start to fill up as we do additional LTI launches against our material, um, 
and I won't go to a cor uh, course using this, this is a sample space, um, but we do have courses with multiple outlines as well as multiple associations. So this is saying, just so you're aware, the page you're currently viewing is in use in this section. Uh, this will only show active sections. So if we bounce over to one that isn't using it, and um, I, I lied, we'll, we'll go to a course. So let's look at one that has that as an example quickly realizing that this um, this short demo, quote unquote, is uh, becoming a rather lengthy one. But I, I've been very excited about this for a very long time. So we go in here, this is our Architecture 100 course. We can see under admin, we have multiple sections in here because this course is run before and we have the master section. Um, you can see we also have some additional options here. This is more of the instructional designer type of view. Uh, for the true instructional designer, you'll log in as one of our IDs. Something else that I hope you can appreciate if you're really deep into Drupal is the standard user experience that we're trying to push. So there's always an admin tab, um, and it's always responsive. Um, that's a big, big thing with our Drupal 7 technologies is that everything is nice and happy responsive. Um, so we've got a very standard user experience that goes across not only courses because these are actually different Drupal sites. Uh, so we can kind of fork what their functionality is if we want to try something new, if I want to get this, you know, some a new block we're working on or whatever uh, that has like a, a Yammer or a Twitter feed. We could put that in here first without having any impact on this space. Uh, this is a concept from the Drupal 6 version of Elms, except um, Drupal 6 version of Elms was one site, one system, um, one point of failure, quite frankly. Uh, whereas this is taking that organic group from Drupal 6 and fragmenting it across multiple Drupal sites um, to form potentially a very large network of Drupal sites. Um, I have some some visuals and things of that if if you if you're interested. But effectively, we're trying to split the learning management system apart so we can create this Elms learning network that's hyper connected um, and has basically your experience spread across lots and lots of Drupal sites. But these little instances are kind of stitching everything together. Um, every system that's produced in this network of systems is now a, um, a live RESTWS powered web service. Uh, RESTWS is a module. So you can query and access content from any other point in the network. Again, these are secure connections. They happen over kind of a back channel. So when I say you, I mean the systems can have this conversation so that we can have user pass seamlessly between different systems that each meet different needs um, maybe some are running Drupal 6. I'll show you some things in this demonstration actually are running Drupal 6. Um, for example, if we were to go to a video, this I won't play the video, but load it up. Um, this is actually loading from a different place. So that all of our media, images, video, what have you, is served up from Drupal 6. That works very well. There's no reason for us to migrate that system at this time. Why hold back innovation of the entire platform uh, for me to get that up to speed, right? So using LTI, because the LTI thing spiders out to all these services, we're able to push someone between systems uh, very seamlessly and provide a, a secure experience, which can have different, you know, secure has different implications potentially. Uh, we can get to out to a studio tool and our studio tool, which is highly experimental and I'm not suggesting that it's done in any way, um, but our studio tool might have a very different permission and access mechanism than our other tools. So again, a very different theme. An LTI launch can pre-populate this as well. Uh, we've got our administration toolbar over here. I have to get this up to snuff with the other ones. You can see we have our standard tabs, which can all communicate back to the central bank. Um, and again, I said, you know, this has very different functionality, very different way of handling things um, that maybe when I make a post here, it's, this is public. 
within the context of people taking this course, right? So we could have that type of an implication versus our media system, uh, for example, which will have no ability for anyone to get to it unless you're in the course for you know, copyright protection reasons, versus our course content, the content outside of the, um, the actual media, you know, just the text and tables and things like that, uh, maybe we just open source that and that's free. And that, that is a conversation we're having that should happen in the near future uh, to go along with the Elm Style Guide, which will also be released shortly. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of moving parts, a lot of really exciting stuff from my perspective going on right now. Um, and we are running all of these technologies in production. Uh, so I feel very confident in marking things uh, from more of a developmental alpha state to uh, more of a release candidate state, quite frankly. Uh, we've been beta testing for about five months now. Um, or, well, I'd say alpha testing for five months, beta testing for the last three months. And have had very, very little hiccups um, throughout. So we're starting to do a full-scale migration of all systems go uh, to this platform. Jump in and just edit some stuff. Uh, image button, so you can you know embed stuff. The image. Uh, we have some styles that are standard. Um, very few, right? And and the headings, which are you know very standard. We're trying to really push good accessibility defaults with our our selection of modules, uh, as well as themes that are that are developed, uh, and I can't, apparently, you can't tab in Safari, that's interesting. Um, but I'll be working on this and starting to showcase and release many more parts of this system, uh, as well as increasing the documentation of it at the Elms blog, which uh, just got released today. So it's elms.pshu.edu, which now redirects to the blog. Um, and on it, I have an example today of why this learning technology has been constructed in Drupal at all, and it's the Profiler Builder module. Profiler Builder was created so that I could create distributions, uh, versions of Drupal, if you will, more rapidly. Uh, I anticipate having to maintain and support upwards of 10 uh, active distributions. I have about 10 tools planned out for this network. Um, and Profiler Builder helps a lot in the automation side of things. So what it does, basically, you build a site. When you're done, you can stamp it back out in a reliable fashion uh, so that you can stand it back up again. It's kind of the way the whole Elm stack uh, works with the Elm's learning network. Uh, someone took this, um, this M, M. Critterton, um, and created a personal blog using it called the medium blog distribution. Now, it, this isn't anything special. I, I'm not, I don't want to harp on this. This is a very simplistic blog. Um, but it was a great starting point for me to augment with the power of Drupal all these different things, right? So I can get in nice text editors. I can get um, the ability to tag things. I can get auto posting to Twitter. I can get discuss based comments for, you know, social comments from uh, without the need to have local logins, things like that. Um, and I got this because I was participating in the Drupal community and giving code back to the Drupal community. As a result, someone goes, that's a great idea. I want to take it and actually run with it. They put something out there, and then I'm able to ingest that idea back into uh, what we do. So it's a perfect example of why things are being developed this way in my mind. Because eventually, we want to get from this to something more like this, as I typically term structured anarchy, um, that this ecosystem is so dense that it seems completely overwhelming. Um, even just diving into the, the database patterns that exist currently, um, it can be a bit overwhelming at an initial glance that this is all happening out of one office effectively. And I can't SSH tunnel in right now, which is annoying. <laughs> but basically, every site has a Drupal database associated to it. Um, it's more about the patterns at which things are structured and organized that it becomes very clear that the, the, there's a lot of planning that's gone into this. And it's very easy to maintain 
uh, such a massive grouping of systems. Uh, something else that helps with the, the management of them is uh, if we go to drupal.fishu.edu, I believe I did a post about it. Um, automatic drush aliasing. Uh, I, I recommend checking this out. It, it can help you know, really get a better understanding of what's going on behind the scenes and how some of these things are possible. How you can it talks a lot about how you can effectively chain uh, drush commands together. And if you want to learn more about the work that's going on here, um, there's the using Drupal to transform education video that I shot um, several months ago. That also takes another dive into into what's going on with this, walks through the presentation materials and things like that. So I'm excited. If you want more information, just contact me on any of the sources I am. This is my life. I'm very happy with that.